I have decided the NXT TakeOver events are a bit like a kid you hope you have when you first have children, because they can muck around in school term and they can look like they're not focusing on their work. But as long as when it comes down to the big exam, they absolutely smash it, who the hell even cares? And that is why we have just had night two of NXT TakeOver Stand and Deliver. And while everyone out there is going, well, night one was better than night two, or night two is better than night one, who gives a flub? Night one absolutely kicked ass. Night two absolutely kicked ass. And if you're into hard-hitting professional wrestling, well, you just got a bunch of it. And to draw a line under that, my name is Simon Miller. Welcome to What Culture Wrestling. And it is time to give the good bits and up and the bad bits are down. When it does come to NXT TakeOver Night 2, whatever the hell you want to call it, Electric Boogaloo. And as a small spoiler, it was absolutely excellent. Let's up those doubts. The first match on night two was to unify the Cruiserweight titles in a ladder match as Santos Escobar took on Jordan Devlin. And I can only assume beforehand they looked at each other and said, hey, let's just do move, 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 go, 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 and have loads of fun. Now, it was a little weird because both dudes are bad guys. And at one point, Jordan Devlin was trying to get back up to his feet. And I think I was meant to be going, come on, man, you can do it. Again, even though he's meant to be a heel. But that didn't really matter because, like I say, most of the match was constructed by just going absolutely ballistic. Like Early on, Jordan Devlin did an acai moonsault. And while he did hit Escobar, he also kind of overshot it and just smashed his head into the announce table. The ladder was then involved because, of course, it is a WWE ladder match and that's what happens. And they were using it as a weapon. And then Escobar just took Devlin and whipped him right into it. And I went, oh, lovely, because I'm a damaged human being. Another ladder was then propped up at ringside, so you just knew that was going to come into play later. Although then another one in the ring was being drop kicked right into Jordan Devlin's face. And then when Escobar tried to kind of flip him out the way, Jordan grabbed the ladder and he was going to scurry up to get the titles. I always enjoy that spot. Santos then did indeed dive into Jordan on the outside. and They went crashing through that ladder that I only mentioned about 32 seconds ago. And it looked like it absolutely sucked. And then back in the ring, they performed one of the smoothest Spanish flies you're ever likely to see in your life. And you'll probably go, well, that sounds like the highlight of the match. And it should have been. But instead, not only did we get another Spanish fly off the ladder, but Jordan Devlin did a moonsault from the top of said ladder. And it was like the most well-executed moonsault you've ever seen in your life, even though clearly he basically killed Escobar. Jordan actually had all this one-two in his hands on the championships before he got screwed over by Lagarda del Fantasma. Because, of course, they were out here and they stopped him from doing the deed that he was desperate to do. And from that point on, you just knew, man, he ain't going to win this match. It, of course, finished off with Escobar and Jordan fighting on top of one ladder. But when Jordan got headbutted, fell off it and crashed through another ladder, which also looked absolutely horrible, Escobar grabbed those championships and he is officially your and mine and everybody else's cruiserweight champ. This was an absolute ridiculous way to open the show though because it's a bit like well how the hell are you going to follow that? We have just seen every single wrestling maneuver possible but my word I was entertained. Up. So it was a bit of a short straw about what was going to follow this but NXT was really smart when it came to format and when it came to pacing. Because it was Shotzi Blackheart and Ember Moon defending their tag team titles against Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae and clearly we had just gone go out there have a really good wrestling match. Just enjoy yourselves. Everybody else will enjoy themselves as well. And then we can all go home and have a crumpet. Uh, Part when and Indy jumped their opponents beforehand just to let you know they're bad guys. And they got the heat onto Shotzi Blackheart. And every time she went for the tag, she wasn't able to do it. It was a bit like we were building to something hot. <laughs> I'm an idiot. This finally happened as she did get the lukewarm tag to Ember Moon who started to run wild. But as ever, Ember Moon, very sadly, was born a professional wrestler. So as soon as Indy Hartwell on the apron went, Hey, Ember, look over here. She was distracted and Candice LeRae just kicked her ass. I mean, one day, some wrestler is going to learn. However, I will say this whole sequence ended with one of those crazy Tower of Doom spots that was kind of pulled off by Indy Hartwell. And it always just looks so damn good even though it is a little bit weird and convoluted. It wouldn't be a match with Shotzi Blackheart if there wasn't at least one fall that made you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. And when she went to do a dive onto Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell, for some reason, they just didn't bother to catch her and her head went crashing into the floor. 
I was genuinely very concerned for her safety, but apparently she is okay, and thank Flubbins for that. It built to a cool finish though, because Ember hit a double eclipse, and because Shotzi had tagged her just before she hit this move, she was then on the top rope, she hit a senton, she got the one, two, three, they retained their titles, and I felt very satisfied afterwards, and given this is NXT's WrestleMania type event, that's always what you should be trying to do. I do think we turned that one down a little bit because we were about to turn up the volume again because it was Bronson Reed going after Johnny Gargano's North American title and this was just absolutely fabulous. Up. Now I do admit that I thought Bronson Reed should have won this. Given that he was successful on night one, it would have been a great crowning moment if he was also successful on night two and Johnny Gargano has held that belt for ages, he can lose it and nobody would have cared. So it just felt like all the stars had aligned but even though he wasn't successful here, I couldn't give two hoots because these guys just concocted one hell of a wrestling spectacle. Because while it was set up like it was power versus speed, as it turns out, Bronson had the power, Bronson had the speed, and he also had the catching ability of a flipping juggernaut. Because no matter what Johnny did, Bronson kept catching him out of midair. I mean, at one point, he gave him this slingshot spear. It would be like going up to your mum and going, and giving her a kiss, but with less love. What did you really achieve? Johnny was then trying to use props on the outside, including the announce table, to try and slow him down, but he just couldn't do anything. Because when Bronson was back in the ring and Gargano hit him with a cross body, Reed just kicked out at one, and I think he was mildly annoyed, like, you trying to pin me after a cross body. What do you think this is? Amateur hour? Go away. I went nuts when Bronson was able to reverse a dive into a power slam, because that spot will never get old. And surely the whole point of this was to tell everybody that watches NXT, Bronson Reed is a flipping monster and you need to be wary of him. I mean, not only did he get out of the Gargano no escape, but when Johnny went for the one final beat, he caught him again and just hurled him back into the ring and Gargano landed like he'd been in a car crash. This was a mauling, a very entertaining mauling, but a mauling nonetheless. And if it hadn't have been for that damn Austin Theory at ringside, who I'd actually forgotten was out there, Bronson would have won because he hit a powerbomb onto Johnny Gargano and he got the one and he got the two and then there was Austin to grab Johnny Gargano's leg and put it on the ropes. Now this was kind of funny because not only did Johnny Gargano just flip his way towards the side of the ring the Major went, wait a minute, I think this is going to happen but he even looked at Austin Theory before they did it but I don't care about things like that. They are just human beings. Things like this gonna happen. Ultimately though, it would be Austin that would be Bronson Reed's undoing because he was so mad about this, he tried to sort it out and he kind of took his eye off the prize. And he got back in the ring, Gargano hit him with two one final beats, which is a very odd sentence, and pinned him for the three count. And I was genuinely disappointed like the good guy had just been beaten by the bad guy. Well, who knew that still worked? Austin Theory also essentially took a bullet for Johnny Gargano when Bronson Reed tried to dive on all of them. He just stood in the way like, oh, I will help you, my buddy. But still, I hope that Bronson Reed does get a championship at some stage. And if you only choose to watch one wrestling match from this show and you chose this one, I certainly wouldn't blame you. As we were going to have our unsanctioned match to finish off the card too, we were then right into Finn Balor versus Karrion Cross for the NXT Championship. And I just want to say this, and I just want to make it very, very clear. Finn Balor is a terrific pro wrestler, and he can kind of do whatever the hell you want him to do. Doesn't matter about style, doesn't matter about story. He will go out of his way, and he will make it work. The story here, too, that he wasn't intimidated by Karrion Cross, and he was just going to do his thing was awesome as well, and it just gets it up. And sure, it did start off a little bit slow, but on a card like this, this actually worked because it felt different, and it just made the last few minutes even more riveting. And Balor stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Cross in the early going, but Karrion didn't enjoy that, so he started throwing him around. But Finn Balor had a masterful plan here. He was like, I know you've got a bad shoulder. I know that's the reason you lost this championship. So now I'm going to try and screw it up again. Cross would still always find a way to cut Balor off, but it didn't matter because Finn had his game plan intact. Like at one point, Karrion went to pick him off the floor and Balor just went, oh, mistake, and he put him in an armbar. Realizing this may not be going as well as he had hoped, though, Finn all of a sudden changed all this on the dime and he went to plan number two, which was, well, my finishing move is I'm going to stamp on your gut so now I'm going to focus on your stomach, and now I'm going to focus on your tum-tum. I mean, at one point, he must have hit around about 57,428 drop kicks into that area. And of course, it was to set Karrion Cross up for the coup de grace, which he did hit. 
and then Karrion Cross kicked out a two. That was really cool as well because Karrion transitioned right out of that into a choke. But then Finn, he had an answer for that as well. And he somehow stomped his way out of a maneuver. I don't think I've ever said that in my life. Balor then locked in an abdominal stretch trying to finish this off and Karrion Cross eventually got to the ropes. And once again, much like our first match, that was a little bit weird. Because even though Scarlett was going, come on, babe, come on, you can do it. I think they wanted me to feel that way as well. But I'm never going to turn my back on Finn Balor. He's the best. It was the last hurrah for Finn though, because I guess Karrion just absorbed a bunch of power from the ropes. And he hit the Doomsday Sayoto and finished off with these two absolutely brutal looking forearms right to Finn Balor's head. He collapsed in a heap and once again, your NXT champion is none other than Karrion Cross. This was always going to happen because Karrion Cross has been NXT's big project for a while. And again, don't forget he only lost the title first time round because he did get injured. But unlike the previous match, I kind of did have this feeling of, do we need to change this? Was this the right time? And who the hell knows what's going to happen to Finn Balor now? Does he go back to the main roster or does he stay in NXT? But either way, it was still a very entertaining wrestling match. And I know I've said that a lot, but that's the point when it comes to NXT TakeOvers. That's all they do. It's like they've got an ent entertaining match cannon, and they just go... And everyone hits you in the face, and you feel great. It's also important to note as well that this was Karrion Cross's best NXT match to date. And while it may not have been the best thing we saw over the two nights, it still did exactly what it needed to do. We then got to our war between Kyle O'Reilly and Adam Cole that was going to close the show. And I don't know what we were expecting, and I don't know what we were hoping for, but the result was one of the most brutal WWE matches we have seen in a long ass time. And somewhat disturbingly, I'm giving it an up. Now, yes, the big talking point is that this went 40 minutes with some people going, well, that's too long and I'd be inclined to agree with you. But it's not like if you cut it down to 30 minutes, all of a sudden you have a twice better match. It just would have flowed a little bit better. And the end result was still pretty damn good. Because it just got more and more violent as every single minute passed. And I'm surprised by the end, one of them didn't have a chainsaw and was just taking the other person's head off. There was no mucking around here either, given as soon as the bell rang, they were punching each other in the face. And I think in around about six seconds, we got our first dive. Adam Cole was then teasing a par driver. And given what else we saw here, I still think it's hilarious that WWE is like, oh, you're not allowed to do a power driver unless you're an undead zombie. But if you want to try and take off somebody's foot, I'll be our guest. Instead, Cole found every single steel chair he could and started to bludgeon Kyle O'Reilly with them. And O'Reilly responded to that by getting another chair and just chucking it into Adam Cole's face. Cole then found a steel chain and that's when things went nuts like Bruce Wayne in Batman 1989. Because the pair battled over who would be able to use this, but what you need to do is you need to go to a computer and just type in random words, but after it, write with a chain, and that's kind of what we got here. I mean, there was figure fours with a chain, there was kicks with a the chain, there was clotheslines with a the chain, there was an assisted backstabber with a chain. This was truly insane and looked like it hurt like hell, I mean, I don't think they were using a fake chain. Even though they had near killed each other by this point too, they were still desperate to tell some kind of a story. So when Kyle O'Reilly was going to bust Adam Cole's head open on the steel steps, he still hesitated for a minute because he remembers that they used to be friends. And I wanted to scream into my TV set, you don't want to be friends with a guy like this. Then I realized it would be a waste of time. He then had a brain buster that made it look like Kyle O'Reilly's neck had just been broken into a thousand pieces. And Adam Cole followed that up by getting a monitor and throwing it right into his head. And I think at this stage they just forgot that pro wrestling was predetermined. Because Cole then had a wrench and he was trying to stab his old buddy. I mean, why the hell not? A tire iron was then being used, because I guess it was like, well, we need to up the ante as much as possible. And then Kyle O'Reilly got the chain again, and he applied this armbar, and he applied this triangle, and it was one of the most uncomfortable, horrendous things I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I thought Adam Cole's head and arms were just going to come clean off. Hilariously, there was a near fall after a super kick, and I was like, come on now, guys, no one's going to buy that one. And then Adam decided to raise the stakes even higher when he was going to pilmanize Kyle O'Reilly's face. Now, I get what the NXT was going for here, but the referee was like, no, Adam Cole, no, you can't do it. Despite the fact that it was an unsanctioned match, and despite the fact the commentator has been telling us for the last 20 minutes, well, you can do whatever you want in this fight, and nobody's going to care. The only reason we did do this is that Adam Cole could punch the referee out, 
I thought that was just a little bit lame. He then did screw himself over though because Cole hit the Panama Sunrise and he had Kyle O'Reilly down for the 1-2-3. But of course there was no official. He was over the other side of the ring nursing his face. Kyle was properly selling this too like he had nothing left and yet they still managed to fight their way onto the entrance ramp. And when they were there, O'Reilly applied some kind of a choke so Adam Cole walked over to the staging and he chucked both of them through it. This whole thing really was nuts and when they emerged from there they were both bleeding and they followed it up with another brain buster but this time on the steel stairs. Because who really needs to be mobile in your old age? Had a quick wink wink nod nod to New Japan because Adam Cole was going to go for the last shot but Kyle O'Reilly just collapsed on the floor so Cole wasn't able to do anything then the flipping chain was back. I mean, it was just more bonkers shots that looked like it hurt like hell. And then Kyle O'Reilly busted out his own version of the last shot. And I cannot tell a lie, that one did get me. It was like 2.999, I thought he'd won. The finish came when Cole had Kyle O'Reilly in the corner and was just shouting at him, you're rubbish, I'm better than you. So Kyle O'Reilly just smashed him in the balls. And then he took the chain, he wrapped it round his knee, he noticed that Adam Cole just so happened to be lying on a chair, so he jumped off the top rope, kneed him through the chair with the chain, and unsurprisingly got the one, two, three. And that may not sound very vicious to you. Go and watch it. I don't even know how they did it without busting somebody's head open. Adam Cole was stretching out afterwards to really sell this, and even though Kyle O'Reilly was trying to celebrate, he was like, man, I don't know where I am. But still, the second night, of Stand and Deliver NXT TakeOver Part 2 ended with Kyle O'Reilly being your heroic, excellent babyface. And who the hell saw that coming? And if you now want to put him in a program with Karrion Cross, you ain't gonna get an argument from me. It also meant once again we had gone out of our way to send the fans home happy. I mean, truly scarred but happy. So yes, as you can already figure out by looking at the counters, this is just a terrific pay-per-view event and one that you should go out of your way to see and I'm giving it an up. Now don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about night two of NXT TakeOver and if you want to talk about night one, you can do that as well. Like the video, share the video and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com where you can keep up to date with all the latest wrestling news. Give us a follow on social media and make sure you watch more videos on the channel. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always and we are getting ready for WrestleMania weekend and if there's a wrestling show on, I'll be giving it the ups and downs treatment. I am rocked and ready.